Good evening. It is now 6.04 p.m. on Monday, September 18th, 2017. It's time to call this special called meeting of the Board of Trustees of San Felipe Del Rio Consolidated Independent School District Order. Ms. Martina Sosano, would you call roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Roberto Chavira. Mrs. Diana Gonzalez. Here. Ms. Amy Haynes. Mrs. Cecilia Martinez Lozano, myself, present. Mr. Raymond Mesa. Here. Mr. Joshua Oberfeld. Present. Mr. Kenneth Smith. With two not in attendance at this time, five are present. We do have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Lozano. Let the record show that a quorum of the board members are present in this meeting has been duly called and notices this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meeting Act Chapter, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. At this time, if you would please stand for opening ceremonies. First with a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, and we also at this time ask for thoughts and prayers for our fellow board member Ken Smith, his son, and family. This evening we start with recognitions, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, fine arts recognition, uh, a solo performance. Uh, uh, Mr. Rios, the floor is yours, sir. Good evening, members of the board, administration, parents, and guests. As we have now uh, been doing for the past few school board meetings, we are starting off by having uh, some of our fine arts students being featured. This evening, we're going to be having uh, Devin Garcia performing on the cello. He is an eighth grade orchestra student under the direction of Mrs. Aura Trevino, and he is going to be performing Minuet Number no. 2 by Johann Sebastian Bach, and accompanying him on the piano is Ms. Casey Risto. So let's welcome Devin.
Okay, good, Devin. Again, he's from uh, Doriel Middle School, so he's got a whole uh, uh, career ahead of him. So we're very pleased to have someone young that we could feature this evening. We want to thank, uh, again, all the administration and school board for all the support of the, of the fine arts programs. And uh, we appreciate this opportunity for, for us to be able to bring you uh, this talent to the meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. That's always a, a great way to start a meeting. And thank you to the parents for your support. I can see you beaming. So congratulations. He did a great job. Thank you. Yes. yes. I know last year we, we started in the last couple of meetings opening with different musical uh, things for the fine arts. And uh, we were able to debut the the baby grand that we got and to continue it with this is just an awesome thing and I hope it's something we do all the way through May in there so we look forward to that so again thank you um, for uh, recognitions uh, a two written art Delaware High School literary art magazine Mark magazine excuse me uh, dr. Garza thank you mr. Orfeld uh, dr. Rios members of the board we have with us here Mrs. Bautista and Mrs. Gonzalez. They are going to present the uh, written art magazine that we have every single year. We also have the editor-in-chief, which is Elizabeth Rubio, and we have the editor of public relations, which is Lois Umali. Hello, I am Elizabeth Rubio, editor-in-chief of Written Art, Delro High School's literary art magazine. This is Lois Umali senior editor. We are here with our sponsors, Mrs. Bautista and Mrs. Gonzalez. This publication is a means of encouraging students to improve their writing schools and to indulge in creative, artistic creativity. We are proud to present volume three of Written Art Magazine, published in May to each board member. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy reading. We look forward to publishing volume four and sharing it with you next year. And as they're coming back down, I'm going to ask Ms. Gonzalez and Ms. Bautista to step back to the podium because I have, yeah, I'm putting you on the spot. It's all good. No, just so you can refresh the, the, the community and the district's memory, this all started with one of the grants, correct, from the correct. Education Foundation? Yes. And that's how all this started there and has really become quite the phenomenon at. Yeah, we're really excited because this year, um, like no other, the kids have been, um, even before we started asking for it, kids have begun to submit. So we're super, super excited. Kids are beginning to get excited about writing and, and the art too. Yes. So, yeah. Awesome, well, Thank good you. job in continuing on. We look forward to many, many more additions as well. Thanks, Thanks ladies. Thank you. That takes us to five citizens to be heard. Any for one to say anything? Nope. Um, eight. The reports health insurance update, Ms. Laura English. Good evening, uh, board members, uh, President, Mr. Superintendent. 
I am uh, sharing with you uh, the presentation that we are, or we have already started uh, the uh, benefit sessions uh, with our staff. On September 11th, we held uh, two sessions in Spanish, and we also had already two ses sessions in English. So the first thing that we uh, share with them is our um, open enrollment that it will uh, start on October 16th through November 16th, and uh, that all the changes that uh, were approved uh, will be effective January 1st, 2018. We also uh, reminded them of the calendar that we already have set up, um, all the events that will be taking place uh, during the school year 2017-18, uh, uh, and all that includes uh, wellness events, uh, the committee meetings, the board updates, all the newsletters that will be sent, uh, will be sent on a monthly basis. On uh, September uh, 12th, we had our annual uh, health fair. And uh, we also, at that same time, uh, starting on the 11th, we had the uh, 3D mammograms that we brought. We got a, um, in conjunction with TML, we brought in that service, the 3D uh, mammogram that is not available in Del Rio. Uh, we had a very, very successful event, a lot of participants. Um, likewise, uh, this is our, um, I believe it's our third uh, annual health fair. We also had a large amount of people that, that showed up. Uh, we uh, also had our flu shots during the health fair, and we'll be continuing uh, with our clinic starting uh, the first Monday in October uh, throughout the month, and uh, all the campuses and departments will be visited and make that accessible to everybody. Uh, we also will be having, um, on the 21st, uh, the first wellness event that will be held here uh, in the conference room. And we, and next month we'll be having, uh, in addition to the flu shots, we have our pink event. It's already our fifth annual event. And um, we'll be, in November, we'll have you know, diabetes awareness and, and other events. So uh, you can see here the first three months that uh, have been shared already with, with the staff. This next slide is the schedule of benefit sessions that we'll be holding throughout the district. And this is uh, the option B that was approved by the board. And what we did, we included this column you know, to uh, show what the premiums would be uh, after the stipend that was approved that will uh, start or will begin January 2018. Are there any questions? Yes. Yes, sir, go ahead. I just wanted to praise you for uh, your efforts in keeping our employees healthy. Everything means a lot, even the flu shots. A lot of times they don't make the time for themselves. And um, I appreciate, I saw a vehicle up front mm -hmm. um, sometime last week, I think, in, and, and so I did notice that uh, there was something going on for employees, and I'm always grateful for that. I thank you again for your efforts. I see that um, there's many activities that are preventive in nature, and so I just wanted to praise you for all the efforts. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman. And again, the same thing for me. I appreciate what you've done for the employees, and uh, and I would like to have a an update, on board update, uh, a calendar of events so that if, I, if the time is available or room is available, whatever the case would be, I'd like to sure. be informed. Sure. Thank uh, you. We'll make sure to send it out to all of you. I have one of a more technical nature. Okay. Um, and Ms. Valdez, you might also have to um, get in on this one there. Um, on Back on the 31st of August when we sat down and had that final um, meeting to, to say yes to, to all this, to option B, um, that last column wasn't there. Correct. 
right. when everything was presented to us. And I read that and it scares me because maybe I'm just misinterpreting the, the data and I, and I just hope I am, but I just want to be, I want everything to be very, very clear. Uh, on the basic plan, if we look at the basic plan, uh, beginning January of 2018, cost after the stipend, uh, employee cost after the stipend is zero. And the next one down, monthly employee cost after a stipend, $494.85. And in the conversations that we had on the 31st, I know I asked several times that what they will actually be charged was that 2920 No, that the, on the, the column that says states monthly change with stipend, that is the actual difference they would see to what was previously being paid. Um, I know you can't see my mouse, but if you look at that column that says employee plus spouse under September 2016 uh, through December 2017, currently their monthly premium is 465. Correct. It would increase to, uh, I can't see the next number, 651. However, after the stipend, it would be 494 or a difference of $29.20. Right, an increase in $29.20. Yes. Okay, okay. And then the other one, down employee and children, that was the one that um, technically after the stipend they could make money on. That's correct, it's a decrease. Okay, that's, that's what it was. I just wanted to be clear. I started to freak out there for a moment. And, okay, we're good, awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now I won't worry anymore. <laughs> also, any other comments or, or questions from the board on, on this particular update? No? Again, as everyone has said, thank you so very much. I know it was a, a long process, and thank you for everything you ought to continue to do with the, especially the health fair. I, I heard lots of positive things about that, so that's awesome, especially the community involvement that we got yes. from other businesses that, that showed up to help. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 8B, Ruben Chibita Elementary, Access and Safety along Highway 277, Chief Molinato. Good evening, President Ofelt, Dr. Rios, and members of the board. Uh, today I wanted to update our presentation from our last board meeting dealing with the Ruben Chavira Elementary traffic concerns. Also present, if, if there are any questions at the end of the presentation, are representatives from TxDOT, Danny McGee and Jorge Rodriguez. Traffic concerns due to Laughlin Air Force Base main gate opening October 1st of 2017 at the current West Gate location. Conferences have been held with, with local and, and district TxDOT supervisors in regards to increased traffic and speed zones around Ruben Chavira Elementary on US 277 South. We've requested larger and additional reduced speed limit signs, requested radar signage displaying your speed as vehicles approach the school zone. The opening date has been pushed back to early to mid-November. Laughlin Air Force Base will provide 30 days advance notice to public of scheduled opening date. Laughlin Air Force Base peak, base peak times are between 6.30 and 8.30 in the morning and 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. in the afternoon. 
Most of the, of the base personnel are at work at their assignments by around 7.30 a.m. The district police will provide additional law enforcement presence during those times, and we've partnered up with the Texas Highway Patrol Service to ensure that we have additional uh, law enforcement presence from them as well. It's a picture of the outside of the, of the elementary campus. This is the 55 mile an hour speed zone that is, is the last uh, reduced sign right before you enter this, the, the school zone and you enter the 35 mile an hour speed zone. That is a caution sign that right before as you're entering into the school zone. And again, the last uh, reduced speed is, is there at the speed zone, the, the school zone for 35 miles an hour. Any questions? Any questions from anyone on the board on, on this one? I do. Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, Mr. Trevino, I'll let wait, you go wait. first. No, okay. you go first. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, Chief. Yes, sir. On the, uh, I mentioned, uh, this is great, by the way, all this uh, signs and whatnot, because it's, it's, it's very important that, that they're aware that there's a school zone, that a school coming up, and they need to be on the lookout for our kids, buses especially. But anyway, uh, I mentioned the last time that I um, that you were here about the uh, parking outside the uh, the gate uh, on the fence. That's the, yes. Because uh, they blocked the view, and I think that we need to keep people from uh, from parking right there. Yes, sir. So that's a not a general concern, but aside from that, it's great what you're doing. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Um, yes, sorry, go ahead. Um, I used to be there. I just, um, I, and I've been there at dismissal. There's not enough room for vehicles in the parking area. And I know that they're parking outside because it's, it's packed. There, there's not uh, enough parking uh, areas for the parents, so I suggest that um, take a real close look at that, because parents are parking in the outside area, which is dangerous because it, it it does obscure some of the view from vehicles that are exiting. Okay. But in, uh, I know that there's not enough parking space for um, to hold any more vehicles. When when they do park outside, it's because it's already packed. It's full. It's already full. Yes, sir. On the speed limits, yes, I mean, up the highway and, and in from on the Eagle Pass side, and there we, we've already talked about it there. And I know in our first initial discussion we had last month said that TxDOT in the, the last study that was done actually said we should actually probably speed things up because of the amount of traffic that was going to be there, which is counterproductive, um, which, and, and I'm glad you said the representatives from TxDOT who are here who might be able to explain this next part. On 90, coming in from Laughlin on 90, we have a divided highway two lane on each side with a median in the middle. And it goes from 75 to 60 when it hits the gate out there. And it's 60 uh, to about the underpass where it becomes 50 and then it drops down to 40 before, right before the school zone. Yes. And it gets to that school zone there. So. 90, which handles way more traffic and is a divided highway, has a much lower speed limit than what's out here. So my question is, why can't TxDOT drop the speed limit out there as they're doing out on, um, out on, on 90 east and westbound uh, there? Because this is a much more constricted area there, and like I said, when you're coming up Eagle Pass Hill at 55 miles an hour and you hit that school zone, you're going to run into somebody. It happened to me last week. I was sitting out there on the lane and got rear-ended sitting up there, so I'm living proof that someone's going to run into somebody because I got hit. So what do we have to do to get those limits dropped before someone gets killed or injured severely, and then, oh, we'll drop it. So, 
So coming up is Danny McGee uh, from Textile. Okay. Good evening, my name is Danny McGee. I'm the director of the traffic section for TxDOT. Uh, we encompass eight counties all the way up to Del Rio. Um, to answer that question, I first need to inform you how we set speed limits. Do I have a few minutes to do that? Yes, sir, by all means. Okay. Um, a lot of people think that we have the arbitrary power just to say that road is going to be 55. Uh, I can't do that. Our, our speed limits are based on a law that requires us to do a speed study and we go out and count vehicles and by approximately what 85% of the people are driving, that's the speed limit we're going for. Uh, so I don't have, the, I have some discretion as an engineer to go five, 10 miles an hour lower than, the, than that speed limit. And it's based on how wide the road is, if we have a lot of accidents, if we have a lot of driveways. So to get, to compare one road with the, the other, US 90, even though it's divided, it's a lot more urbanized and people drive slower in an urbanized section. As you're coming into town, you're coming into nothing but mesquite country and that kind of thing. People don't have the expectation at, to lower their speed. Um, I do agree with uh, Mr. Malvinado. He's brought that attention to me that the, sp the speed limit where we change this to 55, it's too close to school. I, I agree with that. We're going to do everything we can to push that further out. And we're also going to work with them to get larger signs out there and a radar display sign. But uh, all those things that I'm talking about, and if we don't have law enforcement, they'll work for about two weeks, three weeks, and after that, people will go back to the old habits. So that's just a brief description of how we set that. So if I were to go out there right now, I have no doubt that the speed limit for 55 would probably even go higher than that. But I'll, I'll do everything I can just to put, push the 55 out further so that by the time they get to the 55, they'll have a mile or so to slow down to the 55 and then get used to the 35. I'm not sure that answers your question or not, but that's the way we do have to do speed limits. Um, well then, and I, and I understand you have limited in what you can do mm -hmm. there. So um, what's the next stop after your regional office? If we feel this is a danger to our students, who do we elevate it to? after the regional office or, or your well, section? It, it, it's, a, it's a district office. From there, you would need to contact someone in our, in our division office in Austin. I can give you information or send it to Mr. Maldonado if you want to send up okay. a, a letter or, or a phone call, whichever you want. Okay. All righty. So that, that's just what I worry about there, and I'm passionate about it because my daughter and wife go there. And like I said, I got hit last week. And there's been a major 18-wheeler accident out there near the school where somebody was killed, and then another vehicle accident on the other side where somebody was killed. Yeah. Well, like and I said, there. so the numbers are there, but unfortunately. Well, the speed, the speed limit, setting the speed limits is one thing, but us looking into doing anything that's required of safety-wise is something else. They're totally independent things. I mean, just because I can't lower the speed limit doesn't mean I can't go out and do something else. So if we just let us know what exact location you're talking about, we'll go out and look at it. That's what we do with traffic signals, signs, uh, reconfiguring the highway, whatever we need to do. Okay. We appreciate the help. Okay. Any questions? Anyone else? Thank you, sir. I appreciate Thank you. it. Any other questions? No. Thank you, Chief. Right. I have a question. Yes. I'm sorry, Chief. Yes, sir. He, uh, the gentleman indica indicated that lowering the traffic signs was one issue, but that there was something else he could do. What else is there that can be done? I'm not sure what he referenced that to. I'm sorry, so you, you mentioned that lowering the, the speed limit was one thing, but there were other uh, things that you could do to make it safer. What, what, okay. what do those, some of those things include? Okay. Well, in general or that particular site with the school? In that particular site. Well, the, the first thing we're going to go out there is we are going to go out and move, hopefully move the speed limit out to further out so that the transition isn't as close to the school. I have no doubt we can do that. 
The other thing is we, we can put up larger signs. Uh, we can put up a sign with a red border. It kind of takes away the excuse for someone to say, I didn't see the speed limit. You know, that's kind of the number one excuse that a lot of people use. So by pushing it out, we can make the signs a lot more legible. We, we actually have signs that have little LEDs on them. Have you seen those? Those, I mean, the LEDs are this big, but you can see them from half a mile away. Sometimes I even have to lower the intensity, they're so bright. So we, we can do that kind of thing. Uh, we talked about putting up a radar display sign that says your speed on it. That seems to work very well, like I said, but it needs to be in conjunction with law enforcement. If there's no law enforcement coverage in the area, people will start disregarding it. But if there is, you know, an occasional, the, it, it works a lot better. And then if, once those things are in place, we'll, we'll check again. If not, we can start seeing about restriping, um, making the, the area a little bit more noticeable. That, those are the kind of things we look for. Well, we appreciate that. And uh, given the revised timeline that Laughlin has shared, uh, would, would we be um, pushing our expectations if, if we hope for these things to be completed by the time the, that gate opens? Uh, November? I think I was told November. It, it might be a little bit tight the way it has to work for us as we do this, the study. We send it to Austin, they verify it, they agree with, with our recommendations to lower speed, move signs, et cetera. And it has to go to the Texas Transportation Commission. They actually have to vote on it first, and that's when it becomes law. Then we have to send it to our guys, get the signs manufactured, get the signs moved. So November might be a little hard to do, but we'll, we'll do everything we can. I mean, we've already started on it. We've already planned to go out there and do the study. What would a normal timeline look like for all to, this? Effort? From, from Inception of a study to the actual science getting up, about six months. So we're going to try and do it about half the time. Thank you. Would you need an official request from this governing body to go in and say, um, you know, we'd like the big LED signs, or is that just contingent on funding or whatever text dot wants no, I, to? No, like I said, I'm, I'm the director of the section. I, I manage my own budget, and I'm, I'm proposing those things right now. Okay. Yeah. Because I think something along the lines of the, the bright LEDs mm -hmm. um, would definitely grab attention. And then also, like you said, maybe also the the radar unit in there, because I know how traffic can be going in and out of that base. Yeah. Well, uh, there it, it won't be a radar unit if, you, if you're talking about the kind of trailer. No, no, the, no. This will be a sign it's mounted. It's built into with, the sign, yes, okay. right? I just want to yes. make sure we understood each other. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. no. Yeah. Oh, that, 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 that we can... We can order right now. It takes about a month to get, but we'll get it in plenty of time before. The hardest part that I, like I, said, I just can't install anything until it's made law. Mm -hmm. So I have all the supplies, but just I can't send it work order to my guys to install it until the uh, commission approves the okay. speed limits. But we, we will rush it with everything we can. All right. I appreciate it, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Eight C facilities and construction report. Ms. Hinge, Mr. Hinge. Good evening, President Overfelt, members of the board, Dr. Rios. For the uh, facilities. Um, construction and technology update tonight. I'd like to cover new construction, um, specifically the roofing status, Laughlin campus, uh, facility painting, uh, Garfield and Chavita, facility repairs for San Felipe Memorial Middle, and the technology update on Channel 39 broadcast. The roofing project at this point uh, was scheduled to be completed on 915. Um, to this, to date, we, uh, we have completed the project and we're in the process of doing our final walkthroughs right now um, and finishing up any paper, additional paperwork that we have at this point. So I'm anticipating all that will be completed by the first. Uh, Laughlin Bay School, um, at this point we are working on the grading site plan that's in progress. Uh, furniture meeting was rescheduled from 
the update that I had last month. Um, the complete final floor plans are due on 10-1. Uh, final plan review will be on 10-1. Advertise for RFCP on 10-1. Receive RFCP on 10-24 and start awarding contracts on 11-1. And I'll keep the board posted as we continue on that timeline so we can make adjustments or identify any areas that um, may be changing as far as those times go. And then I've been sure to include a site plan. I think it's it's been a while since that's been presented. So um, the site plan here identifies where the office as well as all the portables will be laid out on the playground or around the playground area. And we are currently uh, working through the uh, plans on utilities, where they're going to be going on to the, the location and, and just exactly how those are going to be getting there. Facility painting project. Currently the external um, location as far as Garfield Elementary has been completed. Ruben Chavita, they just started on that this week. So we will have some more updates for that as that continues. San Felipe Memorial Middle, we, uh, we identified a opportunity over at the gym where insulation was starting to become exposed, so our internal maintenance staff went through and, and framed up the area, and there's a picture at the bottom that shows the um, outcome of that project. And Channel 39, uh, that was scheduled to be upgraded and in place on Friday last week. I received a call at the end of the day on Friday last week and uh, Spectrum is looking to, res or they wanted to reschedule that for this Friday because they're having difficulties getting the technical resources out here from San Antonio to be able to finish that project off. So, questions? Questions, comments concerning construction within the district? Was there a roofing project at Del Rio Middle School? Yes, there was. So has it been completed? I believe at this point it has been. They may be finishing up some final things on it. That's why we put that in the schedule there for an additional two weeks to finish up any loose ends at this point. But all of the, uh, the roof drains out there have been completed. Um, in the past, they weren't working very well, so we were having a lot of standing water on that roof. So we made some modifications to the drains, and now those seem to be working fine. And then we also had air conditioning units that were replaced up there at the same time the roof was being done. Okay, because I, I did notice from the highway, you could see that either some metal framing or at the edge is missing, or may perhaps that had not been completed. They may, they may be waiting on some of that material to come in yet. Um, I do know that there was a, about a two-week delay on the project because they were waiting for the tin to get pre-manufactured and delivered here. So that might be one of those things they're finishing up. I received an update this morning from Kissling Architects, which are the ones overseeing the project, and it sounded like the, that they were pretty much done with it. So. Okay. I, I just... Um I had thought that it was past the due date that it was supposed to have been done, which you, you mentioned that there's a two-week delay. The, they, they, to my understanding, they did have rain days in there, and they did not use those rain days. And right now it's just making sure because of the, the size of the project, uh, we want to make sure that all the paperwork's in order, that we have all the warranties for the work that's being done and things like that. So it's more administrative at this point. But there, there could be one or two, you know, little details out there to finish up. I went to the majority of the campuses today, and I will follow up at middle school first thing in the morning. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments on construction on Laughlin? Um, when do we? Um, and I know we're not planning on opening until August of, of 2018 now, um, but do we have a, a timeline there where 
the buildings we expect the buildings to to be in that we ordered and everything ready to go before the, the first day of school have we got that far out yet uh, polymer has already received the down payment on the portables and they require about three weeks they can have them built right now we're trying to get the grading done and and work through all the uh, permits and paperwork that we need to be able to dig and start moving dirt around for the utilities and those types of services. Uh, once we have those in place, then it's it's just a matter of getting the portables brought out there. Right now, our tentative date to have everything completed, we're targeting April 1. Okay. And with holidays coming, that's pretty aggressive. Right. So, but we are on schedule. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Eight reports D San Felipe Del Rio CISD STEM 2025. Dr. Rios, who had to step out, so. Ms. Gomez, Ms. Hernandez. Good evening, Mr. Overfelt. Dr. Rios and members of the board. Tonight I will be making a presentation on our latest educational initiative, STEM 2025. STEM 2025 is being developed to improve educational and academic structures, which will lead to an increase in the number of students that are actually participating in our advanced math level courses. And to lead an increase in the number of students who have potential for successfully completing a science, technology, engineering, or math pathway. Some educational statistics behind this. Approximately 800 students are enrolled in our district in first grade each year. Approximately 800 eighth graders are enrolled in our district each year. In the spring of 2015, out of those 800 students in eighth grade, about 124 students of eighth graders took the Algebra I and actually tested on the EOC in eighth grade. In the spring of 2016, about 135 students in eighth grade took the Algebra I and tested EOC. This past spring in 2017, 117 eighth graders took the Algebra I and tested on the EOC exam. This trend defines the number of students who have potential for successfully completing a STEM pathway. And as you can see, the numbers have decreased this past year. There's some research behind STEM programs that I'd like to share. The Nation Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Education Crisis has been well documented. STEM jobs are expected to grow 70% faster than overall employment during the next several years. Yet, few, few students show interest in math and science in schools. The United States is falling behind other countries, ranking 20th in science and 27th in math among 34 major countries evaluated in international student assessment tests. Additionally, fewer than 40% of the nation's 12th graders are academically prepared for college coursework in math and reading upon graduation. Critical gaps exist in STEM achievement among low-income students, minorities, and female students. Women and minority groups represent roughly 70% of the American college students, yet represent only 45% of the undergraduate STEM degree holder. making a STEM connection. A key feature of this argument should be that we cannot build additional STEM pathways 
like the ever-popular cybersecurity, because we currently are not producing enough students with math, science, and technology skills prepared and ready to enroll and excel in these pathways. Therefore, we need a plan. The San Felipe del Rio CISD STEM 2020, 2025 plan is being created to increase the number of students reaching advanced level classes from 125 to approximately 375 students to fill the school STEM, high school STEM pathways and have enough academic capacity at Del Rio Middle School and a STEM magnet. In order to do that, we have to start with our elementary math program. To build student capacity, we need a long-range plan to build curriculum, to build teacher capacity, resources, learning time, and student support from first through eighth grade. To build a strong STEM curriculum, we need to call upon a curriculum task force that can take a planning protocol approach and complete a vertical alignment to redesign our curriculum from Algebra 1 and work backwards to first grade. Finally, to initiate the San Felipe del Rio CISD STEM 2025 plan, we need to begin our search for exceptional math teachers across the district. They hold the key and the repertoire of skills needed for redesigning an excellent STEM preparation program. Just last week, the principals were asked to submit their nominations for some excellent math teachers in first through eighth grade so that we could build that cohort of teachers and start that thinking capacity of how it is that we're gonna start at eighth grade and build a strong vertical alignment downward. We've always built it upward, but if we're gonna get 350% of our eighth graders to be qualified to take the Algebra one, then we need to have a plan that starts very early on. Any questions? Questions, comments from anyone? Samosa? I'm so glad that you're looking at um, the statistics part of it. Um, leadership TASB has had some presentations some years back in San Antonio regarding college readiness. And the question was, do these students need to be prepared whether they go to college or whether they take a vocation? And the answer was yes. They, they have to be prepared because they're going to be given an examination and they're going to have to be required to pass that examination for any licensor licenses that they will acquire, whatever direction they, ta they take, whether it's college readiness or CTE. They still have to take some kind of examination to be able to be certified. And so I'm glad that this is coming and uh, that you're being prepared to follow along with that. Um, and it's it's great to see this in place because it, it will take some, some years to yes. be able to get there to reach that goal. But I'm glad there's going to be a start to do, as we saw the numbers decline, there's no reason for it to decline. They should be increasing every year. Yes, sir. We're very confident we have the students and the teachers, but we do need a, a very strong and focused plan of action. Oh, great. Thanks. Anyone else? Mr. Trevita? Again, I'm in the same uh, opinion as uh, Mr. Mesa here. I I'm glad we're doing something like that because it, uh, our kids need to be analytical, but they don't understand exactly what they're doing. So if we start at the first grade teaching them the, the uh, theory behind it and being able to analyze the formulas and see it, not just because they give you the formula to work out something. Um, I had a lot of problems when I was going to college, and here I am a math and chemistry and physical education major. And, uh, and when I first went to college and I saw, uh, started taking calculus, 
first time I ever seen it, it was just like Greek to me. I just didn't understand it. And the first comment that my professor said is because you don't understand math. You, you thought you knew it, but you don't. So anyway, uh, I'm hoping that our kids can, can start at that point and be, like you were saying about being ready for college, uh, it's very important. It's uh, important for them. It's not uh, an embarrassment of the district. Uh, way back up in there, those years when I was going to school, which is quite back. But uh, I'm glad you're doing something and starting them out there and, and developing the teachers so that they really understand exactly what it is that they're teaching so they can break it up to where the kids will understand. Yes, Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate what you guys are doing. And it's, it's a continuous. I mentioned it to, uh, well, your group, uh, last time I came over to visit your, your cabinet, that, uh, yes. that it takes the village to educate. Well, right now you are the village. You're taking the whole, and I'm hoping that one of the days I, the whole city will take a hold of it and start pushing the kids to go. Uh, I heard one of our teachers tell me, uh, telling somebody that he would not accept anything less than 95. And that's great. And you know where the kids are? They're one of them or two chemical engineers or engineers of some kind at the University of Texas and the other one is working on the doctoral program. So that's great. That's great. So we can get everybody, every parent to really push those kids. We're going to be wonders because it takes the combination of all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. What else? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Nine consent agenda. Does any board member wish to pull any item or discuss any item on the consent agenda before we take a vote on it? Yes, sir. I just, I just have a question. Yes, sir. Um, what is the IS core? Uh, that's on the F1. F1. F1 consideration to approve purchase order over 25000 to IS Corp in the amount of $45,144 out of the general fund for the district annual license. Michelle Smith. Good evening, Mr. Overfelt, board members. IS Core is our web hosting service for our Skyward student management and HR management. Okay. I know Skyward. I just didn't know this other one. Any other items? Yes, ma'am. I just have a comment on um, 9C, awarding of... Um, bid RFP, RFQ items, and it's just a comment. I understand that um, the bid for the 1819 printer supplies, there were a couple of vendors who responded. Um, concerns regarding the significant difference of costs with one vendor. So for the other areas that we actually use that one vendor, I hope we're doing our homework and trying to find the best deal for the district. My only comment. Thank you. Any other board member wish to pull any other item or ask a question on any other item? <clears throat> Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I so move. First by Mr. Chavita, seconded by my, Ms. Gonzalez. Any other discussion? All in favor? Unanimous carries, thank you. Uh, donations as is policy. Ms. Haynes. Yes, sir. Um, we have Life Touch National School Studios, $1,289.13, Sterra High School. San Felipe Lions Club, $150, Dura High School. Miguel and Dora Salinas, one microwave aid at $60, Early College High School. Thank you so much for your donations. Thank you. 10 administration, a consideration to approve the first reading of TASB update 107, FJ local and GE local, Ms. Sandra Hernandez. 
Good evening, Mr. Overfelt, Dr. Rios, and members of the board. This evening, I'm bringing forth two policies um, from Update 107. Um, as you recall, you may recall that uh, this pol these two policies we uh, waited on to move forward. Our finance department has been working on developing regulations and pr uh, practices for FJ Local, which is student fundraising, and GE Local, which are relations with student organizations. In this group of policy updates, TASB recommends the revisions to FJ Local, which includes the renaming of the policy from gifts and solicitations to student fundraising. And the policy also suggests the creation of the admin regs, as I mentioned before, to address the student fundraising procedures and include any reporting on fundraising. The revisions to GE Local address general guidelines and procedures for parent organizations and booster clubs, which are also detailed in the administrative regulations. Are there any questions? Any questions on these items as this is a first reading and it will come back for a second and final if anything between now and then needs to change? Yes, I do. Yes, sir. So we have some, some in red and some in blue? That is correct, sir. The very first one is a brand new policy from TASB, and so it's formatted this way. Um, so it came out in this format. It looks different from what we were accustomed to before. What you see underlined in red is what will remain. Okay. just the colors that threw me off. Yes, it's different. Any other questions? A recommendation? Yes, sir. It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the first reading of FJ Local and GE Local and approve the recommended revisions to the language in these policies as per recommended by the San Felipe Del Rio CISD Board Policy Review Committee. Are the recommendations or a motion to accept? Ms. Martinez Lozano, seconded by Mr. Chavita. Any other discussion? All in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Thank you. 11 curriculum and instruction consideration to approve the resolution regarding extracurricular status of 4 H organization. Dr. Garza. Mr. Orfeld, Dr. Rios, members of the board, we uh, um, again are here to present to you a recommendation to get an adjunct uh, staff member for our H, 4-H program that we usually have. Uh, this, what it entails is to have someone out there in the 4-H program to make sure that our students are not counting absent. This happens every year. It's a formality that we just have to go in and approve. It allows our students to attend 4-H, which is a great program, and not be counted absent from school. Um, any questions? Recommendation? It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees recognize the above listed county extension agent as an adjunct staff member and to count students participating in 4-H extension educating activities, educational activities in attendance for the foundation school program purposes. It is also requested that the, Dr. Rios sign the resolution regarding extracurricular ex status or of 4-H organization as per Senate. For the recommendation, I so move is there a second. Mr. Mesa, all in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Thank you, sir. 12 Technology and Operations, consideration to approve RFQ 18-01, Energy Efficiency and Capital Reinvestment Program with Schneider Electric and authorize the superintendent to negotiate a contract for the investment grade audit and design development. Mr. Henge. Good evening again, President Overfelt, members of the Board, Dr. Rios. Um, tonight I'd like to discuss the process that we went through for the Energy Efficiency and Capital Reinvestment Program and answer any questions that you have. Uh, we also have Mr. Garcia here from Snyder Electric if you end up getting too technical on the questions. Um, I'm sure he'll be able to help us out. So to date, the uh, timelines of the board has seen in the past. Uh, I've identified those over on the left-hand side of the slide. Those are proposed dates um, starting back in July. 
We have gone through the posting date, the deadline, the review process, and it brings us to the, uh, the award um, section. And the, can't see it very well here, but the updated timeline on the right-hand side is the actual dates and where we're at with things today. Um, there was a little bit of variation on those dates because of schedules and trying to get everyone together to be able to go through the RFQ process and, and make the determination. Um, the energy, or energy and sustainability plan RFQ process, uh, we received presentations from E3, Snyder Electric, ABM, and McKinstry. And out of those businesses, the ones that we actually received RFQs on 823, we received them from Snyder Electric and ABM. During the selection process, um, myself, Mark Alsup, our construction manager, Kissling Architects, and Pini Architects were at the table to open up the bids. Uh, the qualifications of the business entities that responded to the solic or a solicitation, including any subcontractors to be utilized, should be evaluated using the following selection criteria, business qualifications, financial information, participants, personnel, uh, project management plan and project experience summary. In order to do this grading process, we went through the ESCO scoring criteria sheet. Uh, so it's nothing that we developed in-house here. This is something that's used throughout industry. Um, and as we went through the references that were submitted in the two bids, we, we found some distinct differences as far as uh, project cost, annual savings, as well as percentages. The slide here identifies all the project cost and the totals. Um, so in the case of ABM, they had a project cost of over $27 million and provided annual savings of over $2 million. Um, and the percentage on that works out to 11.2% savings when you do the math on that. Um, and then on the Snyder Electric piece, we found that the total project cost that they submitted in their bid proposal was $43 million, the annual savings almost $3 million, and that worked out to about 17.45%. Um, during the selection process, we felt that both companies were qualified based on what our criteria was, so then we had to start trying to find you know, differences between the two. And those, those were really compelling facts there that we saw the difference in what they submitted. Uh, the next steps of this project at this point, we're on step five, which is investment grade audit, design development, uh, co-develop and finalize project scope, savings, costs, and funding sources. And then we would move into the construction design implementation. And then we would finish up with performance assurance, support services, saving measurements, and verification performances uh, through the needs of training, monitoring, as well as reporting. Um, there, obviously, there's a lot of things that take place along those last three steps there, but I wanted to just give a high overview at this point until we're ready to move on to the next step. So with that. Mr. Garcia, would you like to come up? And does anyone at the board have questions pertaining to this project? Questions for Mr. Hengay before we get any further? Ms. Martinez Lozano. I have a question, Mr. Hengay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have concerns only because of the timeline. I, I see that your RF. Q went out, uh, the posting date, the deadline, all of that looked appropriate. However, I recall having a presentation at a budget workshop on June 22nd. Was any other vendor invited to do the same? Uh, I believe all the, all the vendors that are represented on this slide here did have the opportunity, or they did actually give presentations. One, one to, to the board? No, that's, that's, I'll answer that, Mr. Hengi. Okay. Uh, no, ma'am, we had uh, four different vendors that came to the district mm -hmm. uh, 
and visited all the sites. Uh, Snyder Electric had been working with the city uh, and we were preparing for the board presentation uh, to explain the investment grade audit. We asked them to make a presentation. At the time they made the presentation, they understood and included as part of the presentation that it may not be them that got the bid. You know, we asked them to make the presentation because they understood uh, the investment grade audit process. That was it. Did none of the other vendors understand that process? They had not been uh, in the community, and uh, so we asked them. We felt more comfortable with Snyder Electric. Thank you. Any other questions? So let's say that this is approved tonight. Well, RFQ is approved tonight. Um, and the next thing on, on the list, there's what, negotiations, I guess is what we call it there. Um, of course, the timeline's a little off because it says August, and we're definitely not in August anymore. But. Um, the district and Schneider Electric will come together and say, we'll audit the district and say, this is how much it's going to cost to retrofit your district. And then we have to go looking for money? No. Uh, we'll, we'll visit with them uh, about the start date and the end date. The investment grade audit, if we go through with the project, we don't pay anything until we start seeing the savings. The negotiations have more to do with uh, the time frame and having um, the attorneys review the, the contracts. And to be very specific, if the board should choose not to go forward with the investment, then how much money will be owed to Snyder Electric for the audit that they would perform? So finalizing those details and, and uh, making sure that, w that we agree on an amount uh, is what the negotiation would be about. Then they do the investment grade audit. They come back and they present to the Board of Trustees. Uh, while they're doing that, we have uh, Ms. Valdez and her team visiting with uh, fine, uh, sources for, for money and, and the loan and, and the interest rate. And then we present all of that to the board. And then the board decides, okay, do we want to invest $7 million for a return and a savings of X amount of dollars? Or do we want to invest $10 million? Uh, and then we have that discussion with the board. And then the board approves that. And then we follow the process for borrowing the money uh, and getting them to work. So we say start, um, we get to that point of borrowing money. Um, Is that on the district or is that on the taxpayer? No, that money would be paid out of our operations budget. The understanding is that if, let's say we borrow $7 million um, and we come up with a payment of a quarterly payment, what is it, yeah, kind of $7 million? Uh, okay. We would then expect that we save that much money on an electric bill. If we don't save that much money, then Snyder Electric owes us the difference because the idea is that we don't increase the burden on our operations budget. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. And that will be a guarantee on, on a contract, uh, Dr. Yes, Cruz. that's all part of the contract, and that's why it's important that we have our attorneys review the contract um, and, and make sure that everybody's accountable for what they promised. We're accountable for, obviously, the money that, that we're going to invest uh, and following the, the plan. And Snyder Electric, in this case, will be responsible for helping us manage and making sure that we do see those savings uh, and that they are measurable uh, so that at the end of the day, when we have to pay half a million dollars in, in loan, we have seen a half a million dollar reduction in, in the operations costs.
Yes, ma'am. Just to clarify, uh, Dr. Rios, you mentioned something about if the board does not approve this tonight, then you would have to go back and negotiate a fee for the audit performed. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And that fee was, um, the, the last time it was presented, I'm sure that Les can get a number uh, of what the cost would be or the percentage. I can, yes, I can get that for you. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll have to get that number for you. He has it, I'm sure. Yeah. Just tell me a little bit about the, the cost that would be owed if we don't go through with the investment. Yeah, the uh, members of the board, board president, thank you for having us tonight and allowing us to answer some of the questions. <clears throat> and the investor grade, the next step is really to come together with the district and to negotiate moving forward with the design of, of the uh, projects that we, we've identified in the preliminary audit. We've identified many needs within the uh, air conditioning, the, uh, the lighting, the uh, uh, different por portions of the air conditioning system that can be upgraded. So depending on the squ square footage would depend on the, on the uh, size of the, of the uh, audit fee. I think the last time we discussed it was somewhere around $120,000, uh, as low as depending on if we did something just on a lighting project only, I think we had talked somewhere in the 30000 range just to do lighting only. but. For a comprehensive project, which is the best project to move forward with, it would be somewhere in the range of about 120000 For the audit already? If for the audit has been conducted already? No. If not approved tonight? No. No. <coughs> yeah, they, did a that was my they did a preliminary study to give us an idea of how much uh, of the range of costs. We could go from $7 million to $14 million. We will sit with Snyder Electric and agree on what buildings we're going to exclude. For example, this building, we wouldn't let them touch it because it's a, it's a near building. Uh, we would identify uh, lighting, AC, uh, water consumption, and then they would go do the audit. But we would limit it to uh, the needs that we thought were more immediate in the district. Based on that square footage, then they would, they would tell us the, um, the cost should we not go forward. Uh, and then obviously we would present that to the board. Basically that cost is just for the engineering resources because for the next four to five months when we get our engineers and staff here doing the audit, we're going to spend quite a bit of time developing and putting together a design phase uh, for moving forward into construction. So it's just no, it's very similar to an architect or an engineer that would come in and start developing a project and they charge you a percentage of, of the project to, to move forward, to design it. So that's, that's where we're at. It's, it's a little more complicated in the, the title of it, but it's no different than negotiating a fee with an architect or an engineer. Dr. Rios. The 130,000, let's suppose, is that part of the savings it, when we, at the end of the year and we have uh, spent so much money, will that be yes, chucked sir. out? Okay. We've identified in, uh, in the uh, preliminary audit that, just to recap, uh, $700,000 in savings on a high level that on the preliminary audit that we've already done. And that was very conservative that per year, if we were to come in and do some of these improvements, you would save on a comprehensive approach $700,000 a year in savings. So we're using your current budget would be paying for the project. <laughs> I, I, think the, 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 I think where the hesitation is is when you say $7 million, that we might have to get a, a loan for or whatnot that, that pays out of the, the regular budget and all that. And we just went through um, less than a month ago a, a, a I'm not going to call it a knockdown drag out, but a very rough time 
for the seven of us up here, the eight of us that are dealing with the issue of insurance and, and saying, okay, we're going to commit to our employees and we're going to, whatever that figure was, two million, shy of two million dollars or, or whatnot there. And it's been voiced that, you know, we, we, we need to remodel Garfield over here, what's Gar old Garfield South and um, the current Cardwell, if, if we want to solve the, if we want to go in and, and solve the overcrowding problem at the the middle school with the, the hopes of eventually going to a K to six model and, and everything that's involved with that, knowing that $7 million could easily be used for, for that. I think that's probably some hesitation that might not be, that's not being said, but is definitely being thought up there. I'm, I'm all for saving energy and all that, don't get me wrong. Uh, there, it's just where do we go in and, and prioritize? But Mr. Overfeld, just to recap what we discussed uh, at the uh, first operations workshop, this program exists um, and, and is legislated. Whatever money we agree to invest, uh, the payments for that money come from savings. And if we don't see that amount of savings, they're legally bound to pay that difference uh, throughout the extent of the note. And I would not uh, sign an agreement uh, unless uh, it specifically indicated that and our attorneys had, had reviewed it. Whatever money we borrow, we're not going to decrease the amount of money that we operate with because we will see a savings equal to that amount. And if we don't, that means they didn't do their job and they're legally liable uh, for that. Okay. <laughs> there is no rate, in, a rate increase, no tax burden to, bur to the uh, public on this type of program. And the project, once we get into the uh, development of it, it could be, we've, what we've done with many of our customers is phased out different phases based on priority. So we might find an opportunity to do $7 million worth of work, but the appetite might be, let's start off with $2 million this year and then do the next phase of priority the next year. So it's very flexible, but until we get in and, and start developing and figuring out what are the opportunities and putting that together, and we, we can't get to that first stage. Okay, <clears throat> question then on the, the issue of being legislatively bound to, if it doesn't hit, you pick up that cost. Based on the review here that we got uh, out of those two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven or so ISDs that include some in our area, such as Uvalde ISD, Corpus Christi on the coast, um, Point Isabel, um, how many times have you had to cover a loss because it didn't meet what you so, uh, so in the projected? So in the sampling up there, uh, none of them had a shortfall. So if you look at our business in total, um, we've done over 600 projects. On average, we overperform our guarantee by 23%. So there's normally excess savings that can be used for other initiatives. Now, occasionally, we do have a shortfall and we'll write a check. Uh, a good example of that would be Texas uh, Health and Human Services Commission. In our, our first year of our guarantee, uh, we were short. We wrote them a check for $330,000. Uh, subsequent to that, we've worked with them very closely. And right now, uh, it's, it's a very big uh, program with them. We did about $65 million of improvements. Uh, right now, they are about $13 million, abo million above their guarantee. So we've performed on that over a course of time. Uh, we've never had a litigation on any of our projects. Uh, they'll be measured and verified. Um, and like I said, we've got a very good track record in Texas that we normally overperform the guarantee, but in those rare instances that we don't, we want to make sure the district's happy and a district can make its payments. So, so we will make up the difference if, for whatever reason, you're short on savings. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Based on what you just got saying, in the 700,000 that you say that we might save, what percentage would that be? 
I believe it's uh, roughly uh, 35%, I believe is what- 35? The, I think so. So it looks like a kind of a win-win situation. We, we borrow the money, we'll have enough saving to, to um, make our payments and, and, um, and utilize some of that other money for other initiatives. So. Ms. Lozano. Just a follow-up question, um, Mr. Henge. The selection team, Kisling Architects and Benya Architects, what is the relationship with those architectural companies? We have used them in the past, and um, I believe this was set up before I assumed this role, but it was made clear that we were going to have I'll answer that. Thank you. We asked, Mr. Lasano, we asked PBK Architects, uh, who designed Early College High School and the CT Center to participate. We asked uh, Peña Architects, who worked with us in the bond process, evaluated the needs at Cody Warlaw High School and other campuses. And we asked Kissling Architects, who's currently uh, doing all of our roofs, they're managing all the roofs, to review this because I didn't want uh, current administrators to, to review, to make sure that it was entirely, um, or at least as much as possible, out of our hands. PBK architects uh, uh, indicated that uh, having two architects all, there would be already more than enough and that they were busy, uh, but Kissing Architects and Peña Architects agreed, and um, Mr. Henge and Mr. Also, and two architects, or, or two employees from Kissling, and uh, Mr. Peña himself, the five of them reviewed the bids. Thank you. Any other questions, comments for individuals from Schneider or Mr. Hangar administration? Recommendation, sir. It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve RFQ number 18 dash zero one energy efficiency and capital reinvestment program with Snyder Electric and authorize the superintendent to negotiate a contract for the investment grade audit and design development. Further recommendation I so move is there a second? I second. Mr. Chavita. Any other discussion? All in favor? I have to count tonight, sorry. Five of, uh, opposed? One opposed, passes 5-1. Thank you. Thank you. 14 Human uh, Resources A consideration to approve employee job descriptions, evaluation forms, and revised job classification schedule, Ms. Ida Garcia. Good evening, Mr. Oberfeld, Dr. Rios, members of the board. In your board packet, we included a, a recommended upgrade to the administrative professional pay plan and also two um, job descriptions, one for human resources information coordinator and the other for human resources um, coordinator. The current task piece study recommended to reclassify the human resource specialist to a professional position in order to align this position according to the workload. This person is in charge of all our information system and HR to include Skyward, um, the employee side, PEAMS, any open uh, records that come, that person provides that information, certification, ACP programs, and they're able to log in and see if a person took a test um, that to be certified and how long, how many times they took the test. This budget um, is already included in the um, board approved budget for this school year. The other position is the human resource coordin uh, coordinator. And this one, um, the, the person that was there before due to her tenure, the position evolved naturally as the experienced employee assumed higher level of responsibilities. And as we see trends across the districts for HR, they're moving away from very specialized positions such as the one that was previously uh, HR auxiliary substitute. So we want to be a more broad uh, job description so we can support our principals and directors with other services in HR. Is there any questions? 
questions or comments on these job descriptions, etc. No ma'am, motion, I mean, excuse me, recommendation. It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the employee job description and evaluation form and revise job classification schedule as discussed. Part of the recommendation is so moved. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Chavita, second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Unanimous, thank you. B, consideration to approve the appointment of the local school health advisory council members. Ms. Garcia. Every year we come to ask for approval for our health advisory committee. This is required by law that the board approve a minimum of five committee members, which 55% or more have to be parents that are not employees of the district. And with us uh, today, the names that we would like to recommend are Ruby Adams, school administrator, Nidia Contreras, certified physical <coughs> educator, Debbie Escamilla, certified school counselor, Sarah Lujano, parent, Maite Casas, parent, Daniel Faz, parent, Raquel Torres, parent, Claudia Lopez, parent, Gilda Alvarado, parent, Elizabeth Moynihan, parent, uh, Rafael Franjul, parent, and Charlie, Charles Elliott, parent. Any questions? Any questions? Standard that this comes before us every year? Recommendation? It is a recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees appoint the appointment of the local school, school health council advisory as presented. Part of the recommendation, I so move. Is there a second? Ms. Second. Lozano. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing under 15 student services takes us to closed session 16. Um, yet. If during the course of any duly posted meeting, the Board of Trustees determines that a closed or executive session is required on any item posted on the agenda, that session will be held on any and all subjects uh, permitted uh, under the Texas Open Meeting Act. Final vote is required on any matter that's considered in closed or executive session. It shall be taken upon either reconvening of the public session covered by this notice or a subsequent duly posted public meeting as the board shall determine tonight specifically pursuant to 551.074 discussion of personnel or to hear complaints against personnel and 551.071 private consultation with the board's attorney discussion of personnel report to include the following new hires district vacancies retirements resignations and reassignments a discussion of salary and adjustments to include but not limited to the following justifications service credit master's degree stipend salary matrix adjustment three discussion of the technology director position five pursuant to five five i'm going to go with five five one dot oh seven one i think it's a misprint in here Private consultation with the board's attorney, consideration of the amendments to board policy DEAA local and DHE local. All final votes will be taken in open session at 7.33 p.m. We are now in closed session. It's 8.48 p.m. September, September 18th, 2017. This board will reconvene into open session. No action was taken. A, consideration to approve the personnel report to include the following new hires, district vacancies, retirements, and resignations. Ms. Ida Garcia. Good evening. It is the recommendation, or we would, the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the following new hire. We have Norma Rios for Buena Vista Elementary, fourth grade teacher. Gabriela Salinas, Dr. Fermin Calderon, second grade teacher. Jasmine Suniga, Del Rio, uh, Dr. Fermin Calderon, kindergarten teacher. Laura Serrano, Dr. Fermin Calderon, registered nurse. Crystal De Luna, Lamar Elementary, first grade teacher. Brian Dreskel, North Heights Elementary, fourth grade teacher. Alice Sanchez, Del Rio Middle School, nurse. Alexandra Salinas, Del Rio High School, science teacher and Karina Coleman, 
CTE Del Rio High School health science teacher. Further recommendation, I so move. Is there a second? Ms. Haynes? All in favor? Unanimous, thank you. There are no salary adjustments this evening, correct? No, sir. Three dis uh, discussion, uh, excuse me, consideration to approve the technology director, Ms. Garcia. It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve Antonio Gonzalez, Jr. for technology director. For the recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Chavita, seconded by Ms. Gonzalez. All in favor? Unanimous carries. Thank you. Thank you. 18, superintendent's report. Nothing on that one there. 19, adjournment. Be no further business before. You didn't have anything, did you? No. Okay. Be no further business before this board. Is there a motion to adjourn? Ms. Haynes, seconded by uh, Mr. Mesa. All in favor? Unanimous carries. Thank you. Adjourned at 8.51 p.m.